Okay, let's make a start. So, I brought this little guy back again. You may remember him from the very first lecture of the, the course. So I said this is called a drinking bird. This is an example of a heat engine in that it's using a difference in temperature to do work. But since I showed it to you in the first class, I haven't actually explained how it works yet. So I thought, as this is the last lecture before the exam, I would just use some of the concepts we've seen to explain how this works. Okay, so why the bird is drinking the water. Okay. Now the critical idea is something called vapor pressure. So I'm going to spend most of this class describing exactly what vapor pressure is. And then I'll explain how the bird uses this to, to actually function. Okay. okay, so the start is something similar to what we've seen before. Suppose I've got a box, and I fill this box with some liquid. For example, it could be water. It doesn't have to be. But some kind of pure liquid, okay, not, not a mixture. Okay, so in here we have a liquid. And I'm going to suppose that initially, the top of the box is empty. So initially, this is a vacuum. Okay. So I start with this. Right. Now, if you remember, we saw the phase diagram at the start of this course, or near the start of this course. This is, we can describe the phase of a substance. Is it a solid or a liquid? or a gas, in terms of the temperature and the pressure that it's at. And you see that you get a graph which looks something like this. Like this, and there's a point here where it finishes. Okay, um, in this region it's a gas, up here it's a liquid, and in this region it's a solid. Right? We, we saw this at, in one of the first lectures of the course. Now suppose we're at some temperature T down here, then initially, because this is a vacuum, there's zero pressure here, right? Because this is a vacuum, there's zero pressure. But if there's zero pressure, then if there's zero pressure, then the system will, the, the substance will want to be in the gas form. So what happens is that some of the liquid will evaporate to form a gas. Some liquid evaporates. So then you get a new picture of the box. You've still got liquid in the bottom half. But some of the liquid has evaporated and has created a gas here. Okay, so it's no longer a vacuum at the top. And the pressure at the top, let's call it Ta. So the question is, when does this process re reach an equilibrium? And on the, pressure, on the phase diagram like this, as the liquid evaporates, the pressure will increase. The temperature also slightly decreases. I'll talk about that reason for that later. And this will happen until it reaches the point here. It reaches the point at which liquid and gas can coexist at the same temperature and pressure. And at this point, it will stop. So I'll call this point A. So in this system, equilibrium is reached once the pressure reaches A. So once enough gas has been created to make this pressure, you will reach an equilibrium. at the point A in the phase diagram. Okay. So vapor pressure is simply the pressure at which the equilibrium is reached. Okay. It's the pressure of the gas when it becomes in equilibrium with the water. So on this graph here, the vapor pressure Pa is just that. 
the TA the pressure at equilibrium. is called the vapor pressure. Okay, so that simply defines the vapor pressure. It's the pressure at which gas and liquid will the pressure at which gas and liquid will coexist. Okay, so I got some examples to, just to give you some idea of this. So for water, for example, it depends upon temperature, so we have to specify at 20 degrees, the pressure, vapor pressure of water is approximately 2.3 times 10 to the 3 pascals. So this is, for reference, this is about 0.02 atmospheres, right? So about 2% of atmospheric pressure. And it corresponds to, if you use the, if you treat this as an ideal gas, you can work it out. It corresponds to about 18 milliliters of water per meter cubed. Water vapor, this is. Okay, so that's a bad unit, really. 18 grams, I should say. 18 grams per meter cubed of water vapor. Okay, but as I said, it does depend on temperature, and it depends quite significantly on temperature. If I change the temperature by 10 degrees, then this vapor pressure for water approximately doubles. So if delta T if I increase by about 10 degrees C, then Ta is approximately doubled. Okay. Which means it's a, it's a logarithmic dependence on temperature. Okay. Changing by plus or minus 10 degrees either doubles or halves the vapor pressure for water. Okay, so it's, it's very sensitive to temperature. Okay, so this is a model, for example, if you've just got water in a box and nothing else in that box except water. But in the atmosphere, for example, it's not really like this. In the atmosphere, we've got water We've got water vapor, but we've also got oxygen, nitrogen, lots of other stuff. Okay. So the next question is, what happens when there's other stuff in here? So I'm going to imagine that we take this box and we pump air into it. Okay. So we put other things in there as well. If we pump. The box to increase the pressure. So now, if I'll draw it like this, I've got the box, which has got liquid water. It's got water vapor. But it's also got other stuff, right? And this other stuff I'll do as red dots instead of blue dots. So we pump in air, which is a mixture of various things into it. Now if you do this, you find that the equilibrium in terms of the amount of water vapor does not change. Okay. So regardless of what other stuff you pump into here, the equilibrium, the amount of water vapor the system sustains, is the same. So we can do this, but at equilibrium, the amount of water pressure, the amount of water vapor. Okay, but okay, I'm, I'm being general. So 
the amount of gas, the amount of original gas, is unchanged. Okay. So pumping air into this does not change the amount of water vapor at equilibrium. So this means, if I go back to the phase diagram again, if I got to this point and then I add the air and the air brings me up to some point here, B, it's a little bit misleading to call this the liquid phase. Because what actually happens here is there's an equilibrium of a liquid and gas. Most of the substance is liquid, but there is still some gas present. Okay. So this phase is really an equilibrium. The same is true here. There's an equilibrium between the solid phase and the gas phase. Okay. Right, this is important, well, this is important to life on Earth because this is true in the atmosphere. Okay. We're at, what, about 20 degrees today. So that tells you that water is in the liquid phase. So for example, I've got some liquid water here. But there is also gas, there's water vapor in the air. Okay. So it's not true to say that all water is liquid. You have some amount of gas. Okay. And this is the reason you can get rain, because that's water vapor condensing in the atmosphere, turning into rain and falling down. Okay. So this presence of water vapor is, as I say, very important for us. So we can quantify this, and you probably will have seen this in weather forecasts, you can quantify the amount of water vapor rel relative to the equilibrium amount. This is called the relative humidity. So the relative humidity, now I am talking specifically about water. This is equal to the density of water vapor in the air divided by what it should be at equilibrium. density of water vapor in the air divided by density of water vapor at equilibrium okay and it's usually expressed as this percentage so we multiply by a hundred percent Okay, so, for example, today, I just checked the weather forecast today um, in Buchon at 3 p.m. It had a temperature of approximately 18 degrees C and the relative humidity let's call it little h was 37 percent. Okay. This means that the atmosphere today is only holding a third of the maximum amount of water vapor. Okay. At equilibrium, it can hold almost three times as much water vapor. That's what this is saying. And in general, this is true. On most days, the humidity, the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, is less than the equilibrium amount. Okay, so our atmosphere is not an equilibrium system. So for example, this means that if I have a source of liquid water, like I do in this cup, some of this liquid water will evaporate. Okay, because at equilibrium, this should be 100%. So more of the water wants to turn into a gas. So if I leave this cup here long enough, then you will see that the level of liquid drops because water has turned into gas. Let me write that. So if the relative humidity H is less than 100%, then liquid water will evaporate into gas. Okay. So if I have... A puddle of water, say I spill some water on a surface. Here's a puddle of water. 
then over time, the amount of water on this surface will shrink. Okay? Until there's nothing left. Okay, so the water will evaporate. It will evaporate and turn into a gas. And, and you are all used to this phenomenon, right? If you spill water on the floor, if you leave it there for long enough, it disappears. So what's happened is that the relative humidity is less than 100%. That means the water prefers to be in a gaseous state, so the liquid water over time will turn into a gas and disappear. Well, become invisible to us anyway. Okay, this is very important. For example, if you want to dry clothes, just by hanging them up. Right? If you want to dry clothes just by hanging them up in a room, you rely on this effect. Right? After you've washed clothes, they're wet, they contain liquid water. You need the water to evaporate in order for the clothes to dry. And this explains why, if you've ever tried drying clothes in the summer in Korea, it takes a long time. If you hang up clothes in the summer, they take a long time to dry. The reason is that the Korean summer is very humid. In the Korean summer, this can get up to 80 or 90 percent. That means the process of evaporation is very, very slow. There's already a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere, so there isn't much, there isn't much impetus for liquid water to evaporate. And therefore, your clothes stay wet because the humidity is high. Okay, now the opposite effect also happens. If this humidity, as it sometimes does, goes above 100%, then this means that there's more water vapor in the atmosphere than it will support at equilibrium. Now, in this case, you get liquid water forming out of the atmosphere. And for example, this is the process through which rain forms. It goes, water vapor rises up to the high atmosphere where it's colder, the vapor pressure drops, the water condenses and then falls as rain. So if H is greater than 100%, then the water will condense from the air. Okay, so I gave you two examples of this. The first one is the formation of rain. As you go high up, the, the temperature dependence is very important, right? As you go high up in the atmosphere, the temperature drops. If the temperature drops, then the equilibrium density of water vapor increases. Okay, and for a 10% change in the temperature, the density of water vapor is halved. So it can hold much less water vapor. So as it goes up to the atmosphere, it gets cold. The atmosphere can hold less water vapor. And at some point, this reaches 100%. And then the water forms liquid. So it forms balls of liquid in the atmosphere. And these fall as rain. Another example is if you wake up early in the morning, you sometimes find that on the grass or in, on cars, there is water. Right? They, they have water condensed on them. This is called dew. So dew on a cold morning. It's another example of this. So for example, today when I drove to university, I had to wipe my car because my car was covered in water. The reason is, in the night, the temperature drops. That means the amount of water the atmosphere can hold also drops. The humidity increases, and once it reaches 100%, the water starts to form out the atmosphere as liquid. So that's why you get wet on a cold morning. Okay, now let me start to explain what this has got to do with the drinking bird. So there's a phenomenon called evaporative cooling. Okay, 
which is related to these effects. And evaporative cooling is the driving force of the drinking bird. bird. It's the force upon which it relies. So I said if the relative humidity is less than 100%, then water wants to evaporate. But evaporation is turning from a liquid into a gas. And if you remember, in order for water to turn into a liquid, from a liquid to a gas, it requires energy. There's something called the latent heat of vaporization, which is necessary for the water to turn into a gas. Okay, so for a mass, a small mass, delta M of water, to evaporate, it requires an energy. It requires an energy, delta E, small amount of energy, is equal to delta M times the latent heat of vaporization. Okay. And for water, this is pretty big. It's about 2 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram of water. So as this water is evaporating, it must be taking energy from somewhere in order to turn into a gas. And where does this energy come from? Well, it comes from the surroundings. It comes from the water and the surroundings. This energy. From the remaining water. and the surroundings. It must, this energy must come from somewhere, right? And it comes from what is around this water. So as it evaporates, it draws energy from the rest of the water and the things surrounding it, and therefore the temperature of the water drops. It takes energy out of the water in order to evaporate, so therefore the temperature of the water drops. Which, of the liquid water, at least. Okay. So as evaporation happens, things are cooled okay, because of this effect. And this effect is called evaporative cooling. And a very obvious example of this, although not the nicest one, is sweat. Okay, why do we sweat? We sweat in order to help ourselves cool. Right? If you do a lot of work and you get yourself all hot, then you sweat. This creates a, a thin layer of water on your body surface. As that water evaporates, it cools. Okay? So by sweating, you manage to reduce your temperature. Okay, this is the purpose of sweat and it works because of this evaporative cooling effect. And, and as I said, this evaporative cooling effect is essential for the workings of this drinking bird here. So it's also true that in the Korean summer, when it's very humid, this bird does not work very well because it relies upon evaporation to drive the heat cycle. So at the moment, the humidity is quite low and it works very well. Now, just one more thing before we go on to describe the drinking bird in detail. This evaporative cooling is useful for another, well, in another way, rather than just sweating. So I want to explain what that is now. Suppose we've got a similar system to the one I showed you before. That means I've got a box filled with an equilibrium mixture of liquid, liquid in the, of a particular substance, and a gaseous phase of a particular substance. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this at equilibrium and I'm going to start pumping out the gas.
Now, what happens if you start pumping out the, the gas, right? Well, the pres pressure will drop, and that means that more of the liquid will evaporate. So as you pump out the gas, more of the liquid will evaporate to maintain the pressure. The liquid evaporates to maintain the vapor pressure. But because of evaporative cooling, as it evaporates, it cools. So this evaporative cooling tells you that the temperature of the water, well, sorry, the temperature of the liquid will drop. Okay, so as I keep pumping out the gas, the temperature gets lower and lower and lower. Okay. Because I keep pumping out gas, the liquid keeps evaporating, the temperature keeps dropping. And in fact, what's happening on a pressure temperature phase diagram like this is you start at this point, as I pump out the gas, the temperature drops, the system rearranges itself to always remain along this line. So I will move along this line. And it, it also works in the solid phase as well. So as I keep pumping, I will move along this line, and you can see that the temperature drops and drops and drops. And in this way, you can reach very, very low temperatures. By continually pumping out the gas, you can reach very low temperatures. So this is one of the mechanisms by which in the laboratory, you can get systems down to very low temperature using this effect. And a famous example is that you may have heard of something called superfluid helium. Superfluid helium occurs at about 2 Kelvin, and it was first discovered by this effect. Helium-4 was first discovered. by this way, by evaporative cooling, evaporative cooling of just ordinary liquid helium. Okay, and as I said, you can get down to very low temperatures, and to see the superfluid helium, you need to get down to about 2 Kelvin. So this is an important laboratory technique as well. Okay, so finally now I can get down to describing the details of the drinking bird. Okay, so I'm going to draw a very rough picture of it to show you how it works. It's got a head, it's got a hat on, you know, it's a head, it's got a beak like this. And there's a tube which runs down from the head like this, into a body, which is another sphere like this. Okay, and it's very important, the tube goes right into the body. Okay. And then it pivots somewhere around here. Okay, so it's held there, so it can move up and down. Okay. And the important thing is, the, why is it drinking? It's drinking so that the head is wet. And this is the critical detail. The head is wet. So, okay, so I'm going to call this top part part A and this bottom part part B when I explain what's going on. And this is filled with a certain kind of substance it's not water. I'm not sure what it is, actually. But it's filled with a certain kind of substance. So you've got some amount of 
liquid in here, and depending upon the situation, it will also rise up the tube. Now, inside of this, you don't have any air or anything, so all that's left is the vapor pressure. So this liquid will evaporate to maintain the vapor pressure, and you get liquid evaporating down at the bottom, and you also get liquid evaporating up at the top. So up here and down there, you have gas at vapor pressure. Okay. This one we'll call Ta, and this one we'll call Pb. So, how does it work? As I said, the critical point is that the head is wet. That means that the water on the head will start to evaporate, and evaporative cooling means that the head will become colder. So, evaporative cooling implies that the temperature of the head decreases. And as I told you, the vapor pressure is very sensitive to the temperature. So as the temperature decreases, the vapor pressure will also decrease. So this means that there is a pressure difference, right? Because the head is cooler, the pressure in the body is greater than the pressure in the head. So there's a pressure difference. Now, the system relies upon this pressure difference in order to work, so you need a big pressure difference. Okay? That means the reason that this liquid is not water is because water does not give you a very big, big pressure difference based upon the temperature. So we want a big pressure difference. This means if I draw this line on the phase diagram, the pressure as a function of temperature, you want it to have a very big slope, okay? a high gradient. So a high gradient here means that a small change in temperature will give you a big change in pressure give you a big change in pressure. This is the kind of liquid that you want to use. Okay? And liquids which have this property are called volatile. So inside of this bird, I'm not sure what it is, but it will be some kind of vo volatile liquid. Right? A small change of liquid for which a small change in temperature gives you a big change in pressure. Okay, so now we can describe the way the bird works. Why is the pressure difference important? The pressure difference is important because here the pressure is high, here the pressure is low. Right? That means that this pressure here will force the liquid up the tube. Because there's a difference in pressure, this liquid will be forced up the tube. Okay, so if I'll draw that as a sort of smaller diagram. Here you've got the pressures Pb and Pa. The difference in pressure forces the liquid to go up the tube. So you've got force down here, right? The pressure thing. 
is forcing the liquid up the tube. Difference in pressure forces liquid up the tube. Okay. And then after this class is finished, I, uh, I encourage you to come and look at this, and you'll see if you look closely that once it's the bird has drank from the water, as it does there, you'll see that the liquid is going up the tube. You'll see the blue liquid go up the tube. The reason it does so is because of this difference in pressure. Okay, so what happens next? The liquid continues to rise up the tube. The next bit is a bit of mechanics. As the liquid ri rises up the tube, you reach a point where it, it, it filled high enough so that the pivot point, the center of mass, rises above the pivot point. Okay. So the liquid moving up changes the center of mass, and at some point, the center of mass rises above the pivot point. Okay. And when this happens, Newton's laws of motion tells you that the bird will tip. Okay. This force of gravity acting here will produce a torque, and the ball, the bird will drink. The bird will tip horizontally. Okay. So that's what it's doing there. So in fact, it's not perfect, it's, it rocks back and forth, but as the height gets higher and higher, these rocking motions get further and further down in reality. So we've nearly finished our explanation now. Finally, once the bird tips, it's stopped by some, well, by some supports. It's stopped in a horizontal or nearly horizontal position. So it looks something like this. Here's the bird horizontal now. And you've got liquid in here. What happens now is that the pressures can equalize, right? Before I had PA and PB, and PB was bigger than PA. Right? But in the previous diagrams, these two regions of gas were separated by the tube in between, right? So the gas cannot flow. But once the bird is horizontal, it opens up an air, well, not air, it opens up a gap here so that the gas can flow. So once the bird tips horizontal, you get gas let me draw it red, which will flow to equalize the pressure. So now gas flows from B to A to equalize the pressures. because there's no liquid in between to block it now, the gas can flow. And at the same time as the gas flows from B to A, the liquid also flows from A, from the head, back to the body. So the liquid flows back down to the body. As the liquid flows from the head to the body, the body gets heavier, 
again, so this part gets heavier, and again, the center of mass moves and it stands up. So the next thing is the bird stands up. So you go back to the initial state, like this. Now you've got this, you've got a little bit of liquid up the tube. And again, now the liquid is again blocking the flow of gas between the two chambers, so a pressure difference can establish itself again through evaporative cooling. And the process repeats. Okay, and that's it. Okay, so that's all from this lecture. So let me just explain it one more time. The critical point is there's a difference in pressure. Because of evaporative cooling, the head is colder than the body. That means that the pressure from the body forces the liquid up into the head. As the liquid goes up into the head, this means that the, ball, the center of mass changes and the bird will fall over. Once the bird falls over, the gas pressure equalizes, the liquid flows back into the body, and the bird stands up. So, and it continues in a cycle. Right? So this is the way the drinking bird works. As I said, if you come and look at this closely after the lecture, then you can actually see the liquid flowing in this way. So you can see that it works.